Um, this is Kelly with Eclectic Entries, and I'm here to briefly, hopefully, talk about another film that's in the horror genre that's also a period piece. Um, previously, in my last video, I explored uh, the film Winchester, which was uh, on, the, on the receiving end of some pretty terrible reviews, and, uh, and I gave my thoughts on, one, on, on my viewing experience with it. And today, I'm going to be talking about The Wind, which is still technically the same day, but whatever. I'm tired. It's been... It's been, ooh, with everything going on. Give me a break. So, um, The Wind, I guess, premiered at the Toronto International Film Festival, and it is actually directed by a female, um, Emma Tammy, and I feel like recognizing that because that is not as common a thing as it, it, it should be. That darn sticker just never has quite gone away. It's not sticky or anything. It just, ugh. Anyway. Um, so <laughs> here I am complaining about the sticker on the bottom of my cup, but let's talk horror. So, um, the wind, this film could be interpreted in a lot of ways where the Winchester film is fairly straightforward in being a horror film, despite some of the nuances about exploring violence and, um, like firearms violence and, uh, stuff like that. And this one's, <laughs> this one you could... And I think with a lot of, like, it's totally valid to interpret it just as a straightforward horror film. That's fine. I enjoy it that way, but I also, in my mind, was viewing it from a social history and feminist lens, um, which is a very uh, distinct form of feminism, which is the white feminism one. Um, not just because I am white, but because that's who our characters are, okay? Okay. Right, so th these are these are some characters um, that are are settling in New Mexico, and I'll go ahead and read a very short uh, kind of overview of what Wikipedia says about the film right here, and then I'll get into some of the things that I thought were different about it. So, in the late 19th century, on the American frontier, Lizzie and her husband Isaac arrive from St. Louis to an unpopulated area of New Mexico, hoping to begin a settlement. They live in solitude until another couple, Emma and Gideon Harper, arrive from Illinois and move into an abandoned cabin nearby. The story is told out of chronological order. In the beginning of the film, it is shown that Emma and her stillborn infant are being buried by the other three major characters. Lizzie befriends the younger Emma, whose marriage to Gideon is apparently troubled. And she and Isaac help them repair the damaged cabin and regrow a garden and paint and yeah paint crops. So it is this Alice in Wonderland plant some crops. Lizzie confides in Emma about having lost her son Samuel, a stillbirth. Throughout her pregnancy, Lizzie had grown increasingly paranoid that a demon was coming to her in the night, especially when Isaac was away. So that's a little brief overview of what the wind is about, and. Again, you could interpret this as a straightforward haunting, right? Um, it's really odd, too, because the wind is definitely a constant in this film, but it's also, like, the darkness. Um, and But, again, you could also apply, like, a social history lens to it if you want to be all complicated about it. So um, I think... <laughs> I think that was probably why most people gave it a lower rating, I'm guessing, is because it was told out of chronological order. And even me, like, I usually have a pretty easy time piecing things together because I have ADHD and God knows why my mind is like, oh, it's fine if it's out of order, boop, 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 and puts it back in order. I, I don't, I don't, uh. Anyway, so normally I have an okay time with that. I did have a few times in this film where I'm like, wait, 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 what? And I had to actually think, and then, but then there was a signifier that, oh yes, okay, this was actually before, or this was actually after. So that part may be a bit frustrating. Um, I think that this is definitely a film that I honestly don't know. I, I know I wouldn't rewatch it now, but I would consider rewatching it again, maybe near Halloween or something, and and uh, with the knowledge of everything that happens that's revealed through it not being in chronological order. Um, and see if that viewing experience changes, right? So I think some people probably just, their patience was short-circuited because of that. The other thing is, much like the Winchester story, but I think even more so, this film is slow, um, but I don't feel like it's slow in a way that is necessarily detrimental. 
because a lot of what this film seems to be about is portraying the absolute isolation that these characters are facing. I know it's a little bit of a touchy subject right now, <laughs> um, but that, that gave, actually, I think that all going on right now gave me kind of an interesting perspective when watching this film. I'm like, yeah, you know, like when, when you, when you haven't seen someone's face for a while, right, or different things, you're like, oh, hi, neighbor, waves through window, right? <laughs> um, but seriously, um, this film has some um, creepy moments. Um, I appreciated the fact that when something went terribly wrong with something physical, that it either was extremely pale to indicate death, or its eyes went black to indicate possession. I am happy that it chose that, uh, chose those kind of effects. I'm intrigued by the way they used the shadows and things to portray a different presence. Unfortunately, that is a thing that I'm like, oh, you pay attention when you when people talk about hauntings. Good. Um, in New Mexico itself, if any of you have ever been there, I live in Nevada. And I spent most of my life going to Arizona because my dad was born there and coming here to Las Vegas because I have family here. I also have family in other parts of Nevada that are more isolated. And, um, and I have family in New Mexico. In fact, I recently went there in February before all this COVID stuff happened. Um, or it, let me put it this way, before it, it became very, very, very serious. It was like just, it hadn't even, we didn't even have cases reported here yet when I was going in February. It was very early on in February. And so um, I, uh, that's the other reason why I think I might appreciate the wind more is because there is a very distinct feeling about being out in the desert and the wind like not ever stopping. It is one of your only constant companions if you are out just standing somewhere or you're out visiting somebody and there's nothing else around, right? Or you pull off the road and you just want to get out of the car a minute and stretch your legs. Um, it's a thing. <laughs> so um, I appreciated that the film tried to add this kind of personification to the wind, even if it was a creepy, malevolent one. Um, that was interesting. I, so that became that made it more real for me. I think for a lot of people, if they've never been to the desert, or maybe they don't live on the prairie or someplace where there's just not a lot to block the wind. So I guess even some coastlines, right? They may not get it. They may just be like, yeah, and? Like, that's not that weird. And I'm like, oh, no, no. I want you to go up to, like, a ghost town um, and not be a dick about it either. Be, be nice to old places. Um, go up to, like, uh, a ghost town or a more rural little place and stop overnight in, like, a motel or something where there's not a lot around. And I want you to do that, and I want you to do that either in the winter or any time of year, and I want you to do it during a new moon, when there's no moon in the desert sky, where there's no light pollution, okay? And I want you to tell me that things don't feel vastly different than what you're used to, okay? Because they will. <laughs> I know that some people even now can't really sleep unless there's road noise and things, so if you're one of those people, just think about the people who came and were settling in these areas or people now who still live in areas like on the prairie, in the desert, up in Alaska, in the forest, places where there is not anybody else around. Maybe your nearest neighbor is a mile away, like in this movie. And just what kind of tricks that can play on your mind. So this film, I feel like I'm saying all this because I feel like this film really tries to go there. Um, and bring you into that atmosphere. And in that way, it is a very atmospheric film, okay? And that's the other reason why perhaps there's not as much dialogue, right? <laughs> Which also might frustrate a number of people. Um, I found it to be fine. Um, a lot of times, you know, especially back then, honestly, like, there just wasn't a lot to talk about, right? It's not like you could go and get the newspaper. It's not like you could go on into town and see what was going on. Oh no, you were just going day by day, night by night, everything that needed to get done every day, right? Every night, all your chores. And this is really that kind of film, but it gets really, um, I think it gets really 
creepy in that, in that you realize that that's their whole world, right? And since that's their whole world, the things that can go wrong and can be malevolent will happen very quickly. Um, I'm going to talk about some spoilers right now. So if you haven't seen the film and you want to before I discuss this quickly, please go do it. If not, continue to listen on, okay? Ready? Okay. So for instance, like there's some stuff pretty early on where you're just kind of like, okay, did, 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 <laughs> did, um, did Lizzie shoot Emma, right? Or did Emma commit suicide? Um, and then they had to rip out her baby. Uh, and by that, I mean, Lizzie had to rip out her baby and try and save the baby. What happened? You know, like in the beginning of this film, she is covered, Lizzie is covered in blood. And the two men are there, Gideon and Isaac are there, and you have no idea what's going on. You just know that there's a dead woman and a dead baby. But it's, it's, it's this baby that's wrapped up in these little cloths. Um, you can't see the baby. They never show the baby. Thank goodness. Um, so... Um, additionally, there's weird things going on. Like they keep blaming, like Lizzie keeps blaming the land. Emma blamed the land. This land is not right. This place is not right. And the fact that Lizzie has a moment where she's attacked by wolves and then the goat is, is, has its belly ripped out and its ribs exposed. And then later on, not much farther along, she finds a dead chick, right? These mirror what happened to Emma right? Emma had to have her belly slit open when Lizzie tried to save the baby. Emma's baby's dead. Lizzie's baby's is dead. Lizzie had a baby Samuel, born stillborn, right? These are all weird things because the goat actually comes back to life, right? And so does Emma, but she's not alive. She's a haunting. She's uh, some kind of specter is what you're led to believe. And what's interesting too is Emma is always asking Lizzie, Lizzie, where's your gun? And that was kind of funny in a way because I was watching this with my with my my family and my dad was like, where's her gun? Why isn't she carrying her gun around with her? Man, if I lived out there, I'd be having my gun right up propped up against where the clothesline is. I wouldn't go out there without a gun and da 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 da. And I was like, yeah, you can definitely tell the people who are like from the city or the suburbs wrote this because they don't, they don't. <laughs> I don't want to touch my face, darn it. But they don't like, they don't get that. Um, so we kept kind of joking about that, being like, I hate to say it, even though Emma's a terrible character, but yeah, Lizzie, where's your gun? Um, so <laughs> um, all really dark humor aside, um, it, it the reverend that shows up is very creepy. Like, because like, if you're paying attention, Emma talks about meeting a reverend who gave her this pamphlet, right? And this pamphlet is about demons, right? And it is really creepy. Uh, as far as, I'm like listening to it being like, yeah, let's not repeat those things. Cause I just come from enough of a supernaturally like uh, superstitious household that I'm like, yeah, let's not. It's okay if they say it, but I don't want to talk about them, thanks. Um, and it was, ooh, that was a constant theme through the film was suggesting that the reverend who gave them that pamphlet somehow caused people to become more paranoid. Um, and by people, I mean the women, right? When they're out there on the frontier and the men in their lives, their husbands, so Gideon and Isaac are constantly reinforcing that this is nonsense, right? Which is hilarious because another man gave it to them. So on that note, I'm gonna talk about, if you're gonna bother to view this or attempt to view it from a social history perspective, uh, and I mean history is like historical fiction, okay? And from a feminist, in a very narrow view of what feminism is perspective. I have a few things to say. One, pregnancy um, is being, you know, a dangerous but necessary thing out on the frontier. Frontier, I use that term loosely because there are people living there way before them. But um, so like if you did not produce, you're going to be out of favor, right? Which is exactly what happened and why um, Isaac went to Emma and had sex with Emma instead of continuing to have sex with Lizzie because Lizzie failed him in not giving him a son, right? Um, maybe that's mean. Maybe I'm saying that Isaac doesn't have any feelings and he's probably just sad about the loss of his son. And he should be, and he is. But I'm also like, yeah, screwing the person's, screwing your neighbor's wife is probably not the best way to work out those emotions, bud. Um, cause I don't see your wife going over and wanting to have sex with Gideon. So, um, but 
But the other thing is that pregnancy, uh, the whole thing I talked about earlier, like pregnancy being compared to farm animals, right, or planting. Like, for instance, Lizzie goes over to help Emma start up their, their, their little garden so they can have food and everything, which I felt like was foreshadowing the fact that she was going to have, you know, uh, Emma was going to have an affair with Isaac. Um, and that Lizzie could plant seeds, but she can't grow anything, right? And, um, well, Emma's garden will grow, right? Because, you know, by virtue of her just being there, just like her baby, which is really Isaac's baby, too, um, because Emma didn't have it from Gideon. So the other two things I wanted to quickly talk about related to that with those lenses are the demons that appeared in the two characters. One of them is Lizzie's wife, Isaac. He was possessed by it. And then before then, the reverend was. So it's a bit on the nose, <laughs> but it's comparing the idea of um, your husband's deviant behavior as being manifest that way. I interpret it as that. And then the, the reverend or minister or whatever as um, being corrupted by what he studied as a messenger of a patriarchal religion, right? Um, or what is now a pa more a patriarchal system, in, 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 religiously speaking. I come from a Christian household, it is. Um, and not, not saying that I always am kind of like, uh, or I wouldn't have gone to churches where there are female pastors, because I have. Um, but traditionally, which I don't like that word either, yeah, um, it is that. And it has to do with the different cultures that it originally um, came from over the centuries and millennia as well, uh, whether we like that or not. So uh, the darkness also I thought was weird because it's like the film is called The Wind, but in some ways I'm like, it should be called The Darkness almost because a lot of it does happen in the dark, although there's plenty of creepy things that do happen during the day, right? Um, so I guess it being called the wind makes sense. And then for the other reasons I mentioned before, which is that it's a constant companion no matter what, even when you're alone, right? Um, so I kind of thought, well, what, if I did have to label the darkness something, what would it be? The fact that all the really awful things happen at night, I guess it would be things like uncertainty and fear, you know, all the things we traditionally, or again with that word, um, regularly associate with, with the concept of darkness insofar as it being a atmospheric thing, maybe not a more of a metaphorical thing like what we're talking about now. But like it's fear of being, uh, of being brought out somewhere and having maybe no say, right? Your husband deciding you're going to go and settle out there and having no say in that or no say in being pregnant or no say in you know, like all those kinds of things. So, um, yeah, so basically your head of household, those kinds of things, deciding a lot of those things for you. And that darkness and that wind being probably the only form of uh, companionship other than your partner, right? And because you can't speak out against your partner, all the ugly things are then projected out into the wind and the darkness. So those are some different ways I looked at it, okay, because I think it's interesting to do that. I'm not saying that any of them are right. I'm not saying any of them were the creator's intent. I'm just saying these are the different things that crossed my mind when I was thinking about what did I actually just watch, right? Um, so I think that was, that's, that's the wind. Um, I'm not going to reveal the ending. <laughs> And uh, it's, it's an interesting, again, very atmospheric, slower film. If that's your thing and you don't mind sitting down in a period piece and um, just taking that in, um, go for it. Like, do it. Do it. I, I, think, it's, I think it's an interesting ride. <laughs> I do. Uh, um, yeah. Is it the greatest film like that ever made? I don't think so, no. But it is worth, I think it's worth watching if, if any of those types of things are your, are your cup of tea. So with that, I think that's what I'm going to be, yeah, I'm done talking about that. And I think I'm, I, I might tomorrow, if I have the spoons, spoony, spoony talk, spoon theory, disability, don't know about it, Google it. Um, 
because the chronic pain and all the middle of my spine has really been hurting with Las Vegas having that up and down temperatures and the wind and the wet and then the dry and I've been like, ah. So we'll see if I have energy. I wanted to do a discussion briefly about the, uh, was it the case files of Richard Jeweler? No, the Jeweler. I can English. I got that out of order. It's fine. Let me see. Of Jeweler Richard. There you go. See, my brain's like, hey, you want to swap things? And I'm like, that's not how we English, thanks. So the case files of Jeweler Richard, which is an anime that's um, based off of a, a light novel series in Japan, and it's a mystery light novel series. And I liked it a lot because it had to do with um, the concept of uh, foreigners um, relocating to Japan to open lucrative businesses. Um, and kind of having a part-time university student as your assistant while you're hosting people um, and clients and things like that um, as a jeweler. Wow. So it was very different, um, and I loved the art style. I thought it was very beautiful. And I, I do want to, I do want to make a little video about that. So until then, please take care of yourself as you're able, especially with everything going on. Okay, and um, I send uh, love and. Um, if you liked what I, you, I had posted, I, I can't words right now. If you liked what I posted, hit the subscribe button um, and ring the bell and all that stuff. Like a dinner bell, right? A little triangle. Ring it. And, um, and check out my Patreon and Redbubble if you'd like. Um, I hope to see you again. If you do watch The Wind or you have any thoughts on it, please let me know in the comments. And uh, yours. Thank you for watching. Bye.